Elden Ring's story is among the most obscure that we've gotten so far in From Software's catalog. A lot of the ideas and the main themes presented in the game are incredibly hard to understand. However, a few months ago it was discovered that a lot of Elden Ring's themes and imagery are clearly inspired by ancient alchemical literature. And while back then, before the game released, we thought we had a sort of understanding of the way that inspiration was conveyed, but now that we have full access we can see just how deep those connections go. But before we talk about Elden Ring, let me get you up to speed on how exactly to interpret some of the things we're about to look at. When we think about alchemy, we might at first think about things like sorcerers or potions, but alchemy in its purest form was just the ancient practice of mixing elements. However, this was long before our current understanding of things like molecules and the makeups of atoms, and so it was hard for the practitioners to understand a lot of the chemical reactions. But where the fascination with alchemy arises in a lot of cases is in the literature and the way they coded their findings. Because alchemists of the time did not trust the public to understand their work, and so what they did was use a sort of language only known to those within their groups. And that language typically took the form of occult imagery. It's through this imagery where Elden Ring finds the majority of its inspiration. And we'll start with the most basic. One of the first and most essential items you'll find along your journey is the Flask of Wondrous Physic, clearly inspired by alchemical apparatuses. But the lore entry is also fascinating. It reads, a relic of the physic chemist priests of the Erd Tree. So this directly describes alchemists in the world of Elden Ring. It's a clear and direct nod to where the game gets the inspiration from. But now that we know where to look, let's get into some fun stuff. One of the most elaborate and most famous alchemical literature works is the Ripley Scroll a six meter long manuscript detailing the formula to create the Philosopher's Stone. You see, the goal of ancient alchemists was to develop a means by which to turn base metals like lead into pure gold through a device known as the Philosopher's Stone. One of the first and most iconic parts of the Ripley Scroll is the wheel. The wheel is a metaphorical depiction of the different chemical steps in the creation and the elements required in the process. Now, I won't go into all those details there, but it's the image that we can find repeated numerous times throughout Elden Ring, most notably in the Eye of the Fire Giant. Now, we don't have any lore reasons for this resemblance to be there. However, if we want to speculate a little bit, in the chemical process of creating the Philosopher's Stone, one of the non-mentioned elements, yet the most important, is fire. And the Fire Giants of Elden Ring safeguard the Giant's Forge, which houses one of the only elements that can change the shape of the lands between. We'll return to the Ripley Scroll in a moment, but another example of visual influence can be found in the 16th century manuscript of Janus Licinius. Now if you're deep into the game this might be instantly recognizable for you, but the inspiration here is definite when we take a look at the layout of Langdale the Royal Capital, the many-walled city safeguarding the entrance to the Tree of Life. Another point of inspiration can be found in the Ouroboros, the serpent that eats itself, and the god-devouring serpent which begins its fight from a coiled position. We also know that the serpent ate Lord Rikard, and the term Oro in Ouroboros is derived from the word for king. But Elden Ring's alchemical roots go far deeper than simply visual inspiration. I believe even the foundations of the world can be traced back to the fundamentals of alchemy through the idea of the crucible. If you've played any amount of Elden Ring so far, you've likely come across a crucible knight. Crucible knights are said to be the companion servants of Godfrey the First Elden Lord and their armor says it seethes with the fires of life's crucible, the primordial form of the Erd Tree itself. But a crucible in a literal sense is the melting pot all the ingredients must go in to be heated to extreme temperatures where the chemical reaction takes place. But I want to present the idea that either the Erd Tree or the lands between as a whole is a crucible. But let's start with the Erd Tree. We know that in its primordial form, the Erd Tree had the fires of life's crucible. But I think if we're going to explore beyond that, we need to take a look at Salvador Dali's depiction of a crucible. This piece of art is deeply metaphorical. However, I do think this is where the inspiration is drawn. If we take that the red crucible scene here represents the Erd Tree in Elden Ring, then we need to take a look at the context around it and see if it lines up. 
The central focal point within the Crucible is the Divine Rebus or the Homunculus, which is a point we'll explore more at the end of the video. However, this creature is the main focus of the process, the perfect being. And we know that in Elden Ring, Queen Merica resides inside the Erd Tree. And as far as we know, in the Lands Between, she is the only full god. However, there are those that would inherit her title to become vessels of the Elden Ring and they are called Empyreans, beings that are considered perfect by the Two Fingers. But also in Dali's work are the creatures beneath the Crucible, the mischievous Horned Demons and the Caped Skeleton. For the Horned Demons, I would say the Imps bear a pretty close resemblance, and they are the most common thing found throughout the dungeons which we know connect to the roots of the Erd Tree. And the Cloaked Skeleton to me bears a close resemblance to the Black Knife Assassins, which we conveniently find several times throughout the catacombs of the Lands Between. The Erd Tree is also the place where the process of changing the world happens, in order to become the Lord of the New Age, the Tarnished or the Empyrean has to go inside the Erd Tree and make contact with the Elden Ring. So to me, the inspiration there is pretty clear. But if the Erd Tree itself is not the Crucible, we can also look at it from the angle that the Lands Between as a whole could be the Crucible. And to entertain that idea, I'd like to go back to the Ripley Scroll. Specifically, the section about the royal court around the Tree of Life. In this illustration, each of the royal members represents a certain element or piece of the mixture within the Crucible. And closest to the tree are a king and a queen. If we take this from the standpoint of Elden Ring, we know that making up the Golden Order are seven great runes. Seven shards of the Elden Ring held by seven shard bearers. And representing the whole of the Elden Ring is the queen and her king consort. Now, on the same level as the Tree of Life, we can see the sun and the moon. You see, alchemy works with a law of opposites. And this can also be emblematic of the things that took place in Age Prior, with the Lee Arnian war against the Carrion royal family trying to use the moon as the guiding factor in the lands between. But ultimately, the Golden Order won and the Guidance of Grace became the governing factor. But when we take a closer look at the king and the queen, this becomes uncanny. In most depictions of the magnum opus, the final act in the process within the Crucible is presented as a marriage between the White Queen and the Great Red King. This is an obvious trope within Elden Ring. Just as in the magnum opus when the king and the queen become one entity in the Divine Rebus, this is clearly represented by the joint being of Merica and Radagon. Merica is pale with light hair, representing the White Queen, while Radagon clearly depicts the color red. The game even presents their elemental correspondence through the actions they take on the world. Merica's element is Mercury, the core element in the process, yet distant and passive. Merica is one of the most powerful people we experience in the game yet we only ever hear about her. Radagon, on the other hand, is the Red King, the Sulfur, the volatile and hands-on element. When we encounter the Elden Ring, he's the one that emerges. The two are the divine creature, the homunculus formed inside the Crucible, able to govern the direction of the ages, as represented by the sun and moon. This depiction of the Rebus speaks the most, standing atop the dragon that governs the direction of the world or in Elden Ring's case, standing atop the Elden Beast. Because the Elden Beast in this scenario is the dragon on the world. It is the greater will. It is the serpent in the tree in the Ripley Scroll, holding a position higher than both the king and the queen. But it's our journey as a whole as a character that is the magnum opus. The tarnished is the great work. We are the base metal that goes through the chemical process required to become gold or to become the Elden Lord, which would inherently make the place of our journey our crucible. And perhaps this is why the finished shape of the Elden Ring is virtually identical to the last icon in the Ripley Scroll. The magnum opus, the great work, is the entire foundation of our journey through Elden Ring. But guys, that's going to pretty much do it for the video today. I hope you enjoyed it, and I want to say thank you for sticking around to the end. However, I have a favor to ask. Lately, YouTube thinks my videos are Elden Ring guides, and so they're showing them to an audience that is assuming that. So, I need your help to get this to the right people. If you found the video interesting and are willing to share it with a friend that would also find it interesting, that would help me out a lot. But aside from that, there are a lot more references to alchemy within Elden Ring. However, these were the strongest I found. There may be enough for a part two to this. So if that's something you want to see, let me know by leaving a like on the video. But aside from that, be sure to subscribe if you're new around here, and I'll catch you in the next one.